Brock, you, you both have focused not on dyslexia as a deficit, but as an advantage and with many advantages. What are some of the advantages? Well, uh, in, our, in our book, we talked about what we call the mind strengths. And so we broke advantage patterns down into four basic categories. M we called material reasoning. It basically means spatial reasoning in three dimensions. So being able to well, think what, about... What is it, spatial reasoning? I mean, I can, I can see in three dimensions, but how do I reason in three dimensions? So it would be things like being able to conceptualize a physical object in three dimensions, rotate it in your mind, be able to move around it. Um, a lot of designers, a lot of architects, engineers, people in construction trades will describe being able to, to actually hold something in their mind and either, either manipulate it so they can see, you know, imagine what it would look like from above, a spatial view, never having seen it from above, but just having seen it from the sides, or be able to hold it in place and imagine walking around the other side of it, or maybe visit a construction site. We had a, a very successful developer up in Vancouver, Canada, who described his ability to visit a construction site and say exactly what a property would look like on that particular lot and uh, walk through all the rooms, be able to look out the windows and floors that hadn't been built yet and see what the view would look like. So he was building on hills looking out over Vancouver Sound and he could, he could imagine what he would be seeing if he were three floors up. And this is, this is not a, a fluke. This is, this is um, a, a product of the way the brain is organized. That's right. When you're at that end of the spectrum. That's right. So the, the brain organizational pattern, and we've been really heavily influenced in this by Manuel Casanova's work. And one of the, one of the trade-offs that we see, so there, the, the standard way of conceptualizing what's going on in dyslexia is thinking about it from the perspective, as you mentioned, of disability. So thinking, you know, here's a brain, here, here individuals are having difficulty reading. What's wrong with their brain? How can we fix it? But when we really started looking carefully at dyslexic individuals and families, we found that they had patterns of weakness or patterns of difficulty or patterns of challenge, but they also had patterns of strength. And the interesting thing when we began to look into the neuroscience is that we found that the explanations for some of the wiring patterns that created the challenges also predisposed to strengths. And one of the most interesting things that we found was that there, there appears to be a structural trade-off in the way that the brain, the brain neurons, the cells that process information, are organized that gives dyslexic abilities advantages in using mental processes that involve sharing information between widely different parts of the brain. So linking different areas together in complex ways that allow you to see relationships or connections view things in three dimensions, see whole patterns rather than just individual pieces of them. But at the same time, the, the, tr the structure that gives you the strength in that area also makes it harder to do certain kinds of fine detail skills, like uh, see things that are, that are very closely spaced together, like letters on a page in small print, or to hear sounds that are very closely related to each other, like the M sound or the N sound, or the uh, the, the sound. And, that, that trade-off between skill and these big picture patterns and these fine detail skills uh, that goes a long way in explaining a lot of the practical problems that we see in individuals with, with dyslexia. Right. But it also explains many of the strengths. So but before we get to, to um, Manuel to go into more detail about what, what you were just describing about the way the brain is organized that, that leads to these um, advantages, for instance, that, that dyslexic person had a special talent not shared by a lot of the population for architecture and building. What are, what are some other talents that have emerged? I mean, we've heard of Branson, uh, who is uh, right. apparently very dyslexic and right. is uh, a multi-billionaire and runs a big corporation. Uh, Charles Schwab, the same thing. That's right. Um, what, what, are, what are some of the other talents that, that might emerge that we might be surprised to hear about? Yeah, the, the, uh, the I strength uh, stands for interconnected reasoning. It's basically the ability to make connections and see relationships between things. So to spot patterns, to view uh, ideas or objects from different perspectives, to apply uh, talents and, and uh, perspectives that you've gained working in different occupations in different ways on the same thing. So, so a very flexible mind. And strength is narrative ability. So it's the ability to take pieces of your past experience, break them apart, and recombine them in different ways to essentially tell a story. 
And that's important in being able to remember experience, but it's also important in being able to imagine new possibilities. Mm -hmm. D stands for dynamic reasoning, which is basically taking that ability and using it to project into the future to make predictions or to make predictions about the remote past. So in terms of uh, an entrepreneur like a Branson or a Schwab, you're trying to look at financial markets, you're trying to look at business conditions and say, you know, what if, what if I did this? Based on my experience, I would predict that would happen. Or what could go wrong? We had a, uh, the CEO at Party City this weekend at a conference we were organizing in Norwalk say, when I go to organize a new business, the first question I ask myself is what can go wrong? And he was very good at predicting where the break He can come up with things that might come might go wrong that somebody else thinking in a more step-by-step -step process That's right. Absolutely. Would, would not so, come up with. Huh? So he's looking toward the future and at the same time we had uh, Jack Horner, a famous paleontologist who was there, uses the same skills to project into the remote past and say you know what this what the social life of this dinosaur was based on these these bones in the and, and he's dyslexic he's very dyslexic he flunked out of the uh, University of Montana seven times never earned a degree and is now a professor at uh, Montana State University that's amazing <laughs> that's great, huh? so there's this ability to see patterns and to put disparate things together huh? that's that sounds like you'd find among dyslexic a lot of innovative creative people that's absolutely right yep yes so that's another advantage huh yes absolutely yes yeah. what you were saying when somebody goes into a new job they might do the job differently a dyslexic per person might invent a new way to do the job that everybody else has been doing in the same old way that's right yeah that's also you described we, we were talking a few minutes ago and you described something i thought was really interesting um about the uh, if you change the person with the with the short connectors, as I understand it, in the in the brain, and this is and then what's interesting about this is that we're just talking about the way the brain is structured, and it it's not necessarily a deficit, and you and you're not none of you up here seems to be identifying dyslexia as a set of deficits, but as a structure in the brain that has real advantages. It's not rhetorical. It's not selling somebody on an idea. These are real advantages you've identified. And you're, you seem to be pinpointing where those people can shine and, and not be held back because they're stereotyped by, the, by what, the, some, what, you, what we would call deficits, what we have been calling deficits. Yeah. But you were talking about the, the people who um, have a routine and I guess, I guess on the autistic end of the spectrum, the ones, the people with the shortest um, connectors need to be routinized, right? Don't they, they really thrive on doing the same thing the same way. That's, yeah. right. That's right. That's true. If I can add something, uh, the people that fall into the end of the spectrum where they have many short connections at the expense of uh, longer ones, they can actually do functions of the brain quite well as they relate to particular areas of the same. So they are great at finding Waldo within uh, a picture. It's fine because, to find where Waldo is. They right, be because uh, <laughs> they have very good visual perception and the only thing that they would need to use would be like the occipital cortex. Uh -huh. But if you ask them to actually do something that requires language or any other task that requires putting together different parts of the brain, and making them act together. This is great. I'm beginning to get this, so, so I'm really excited. <laughs> it, it, re it sounds, now, correct me, it sounds like you're saying that when they have these long connectors, th by virtue of being long, they're able to pass through and connect different parts of the brain that can, can come into play in solving exactly. a problem or doing anything. Huh? Is yes. that right? So that really makes a lot of, there's the structure of the brain really is valuable to, to see it as, as a structural question. Right. Because this thing of seeing the trees and not seeing the forest, where you're focused on details and you only do one thing at a time, you only focus on Waldo, but not see the whole, might not, they might not even be aware that Waldo's in a, at a theme park, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they can find Waldo, whereas, whereas the dyslexics might first notice that it's a theme park and have a, take a while to find Waldo. So, but that's because that connector is going through parts of the brain and more parts of the brain are available to the, um, 
so they can see patterns in the whole picture and get innovation, yes. innovative ideas because they can see the value of different things. They light up at different things and how they, how they can come together. My granddaughter has a great sense of humor. Is this, is this partly? <laughs> is it all me or is it? <laughs> Well, there, there's, there are some, like, well, there are a lot of famous comedians, actually, who are dyslexic, you know, like Jay Leno, and, you know. Oh, and, Jay Leno, I yeah. forgot that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, Goldberg. and yeah, yeah, exactly right, Who? yeah. Whoopi Goldberg would be another Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and, and some of that may be the wiring where, um, when, there, there can be kind of right hemisphere dominance in, um, dyslexic people, and when, when a functional MRI scientist like Famico uh, study things like humor um, and um, just like the essence of things, a lot of times that's in the right hemisphere. Um, mm. it's, it requires a little flexibility of thinking. You can take words different ways. You can see, you know, things that uh, are, you know, uh, sort of uh, clashes um, uh, in um, expectation, and that's something that's often a right hemispheric strength that you can. Is see it, are you, have you been studying? I didn't know that. Have you been studying um, humor and dyslexics? <laughs> no, that would be a great topic to study. <laughs> we have not studied it. We have our center. When I was at Stanford uh, until last year, I was at a university called Stanford, and uh, <laughs> it was. Um, at our center, we were studying the developmental process of humor processing, and it was like that, and it seemed to be um, in some gender differences as well, but there was um, a small right hemisphere lateralization in general in humor, or kind of just in those kind of processes.